Check, check. Hey, yo. Hey, good morning, Refuge. Would you guys stand to your feet? We're going to worship this morning. Thank you guys for being in the house. Yeah, I'm going to pray us into this service. We're just going to invite the Lord to be in this place. Would you invite him with me? Just reach out your hands for me. Sometimes we got to stretch our bodies early in the morning, right? Let's just reach out to heaven, reach out to the Lord and say, Jesus, we need you. Come yes, Lord, just come into this place. Take over this place. When we sing this song, we mean it, Lord. Would you come in? Take over this place. Be the most important thing.
Well, I don't want to stop. Come on, somebody. Let's, let's give Jesus a shout in this place. Jesus, you are worthy of that kind of praise. If I could do it better, I would. I want to give you my best. And so, Lord, we, we, we've taken this time out of this Sunday morning to focus in on who you are. I thank you. Thank you that you're here. Thank you that you've come into this place. Church, we usually take the offering right now. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. I feel like we need to go right back into worship. We'll receive the offering before I minister this morning. But I sense Jesus is in this place. And I just want to exalt his name. I just want to glorify the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. The Bible says that every knee will bow one day and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't want to wait for one day. I want to be the place that does that right now. And so would, would you join us this morning as we just lift up the name of Jesus for a little bit longer? And would you, would you try and tune everything else out and allow him to speak to your spirit this morning? Because I believe that two seconds in the presence of the king will do more than a million sermons if you'll let him. And so Jesus, please come and do your thing this morning, I pray.
just that mountain in your life as we just keep singing through this would you just lay that at his feet knowing that he's made a way for you maybe even when you don't know that he's making a way he's clearing out roadblocks this morning this is faithful thank you lord we surrender our lives at your feet Jesus.
Keep it right here for a moment. I'm really tempted to, you know, push us a little farther in our service, but I just feel like I agree with what Pastor Dave said earlier to, in this service that, man, we just need to minister to the Lord for a minute. And we've sung a couple songs, and that's really great. But stretch that spiritual muscle of yours to be okay with the in-between. There's not words on the screen. Be okay with that silence. Stretch that muscle. It feels uncomfortable, but it feels uncomfortable because you're growing, you know? It feels uncomfortable because you're stretching out to him. You're not doing what's safe. It feels uncomfortable because you're reaching out to him and going farther than you have before. Come on, let's just keep it right here. Just worship him, refuge. Yes, Lord.
Go ahead and take a seat. It's good to see all of you this morning. We're going to, I'm going to go right into my message. But uh, ushers, would you come real quick? Let's, let's receive the morning's offering. And, and I'm going to start preaching while we do that, okay? I feel like God's here in a very unique way this morning, and, and I don't want to miss that. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to give. pray that you'd help us to focus in on what it is you're doing in our hearts. We just pause this morning and surrender to you. I thank you for the sensitivity of our team to what you're doing. And so, Lord, bless each person, I pray in your name. Amen. The uh, temptation is to, to try and move on without acknowledging that, man, God's doing something. And I'm not sure what that is, but I'm not God. He is. I don't know if you figured that out yet, but I'm not God. I know when you picture God, you think, that guy looks... Oh, if you're our guest this morning, please forgive me. That was... But I want to start, I want to minister this morning. I, I, I've been praying about today's talk for quite a while. Uh, we're going to start a, gr- a series of talks, a sermon series, that will take us up to Easter. It is almost time for Easter already. Somebody say, wow. Yeah, and... Uh, so Easter, guys, Easter is this unique opportunity for us. Easter is a built-in day on the calendar, much like Christmas, where people are going to come to church that normally wouldn't come to church. Those, you know, those people that come and, and it's families invited them or it's their tradition, they come on Easter, they come on Christmas Eve. And, and so uh, we want to make sure that we're ready for that. We want to make sure that that those people that walk through the doors feel like this is their home, and if God touches them in a unique way, they'll feel ready to come back, right? Amen? So a couple things I want to say to you. One, bring your friends to Easter Sunday. If you got friends that normally wouldn't come to church, say, hey, come on Easter. Easter's always great, and and I promise we're going to pull out all the stops and make Easter over the top so that your friends will feel like, wow, this church did, did it right. The other thing I want to say to you is this. Easter has traditionally been the hardest day for us to get people to serve. And I want to say to you, this is our opportunity to get the message to people that normally wouldn't come, right? And so if I can't take care of their preschooler, our guests that come in, if I say, oh, I'm sorry, everybody wants to be in the service day. No one will serve in the preschool. What does that say to them? And so would you, would you consider being a part of the team on Easter Sunday? And uh, the great thing is we, we, we will replay the service for you later that day. And, and you can see it. But we need your help on Easter Sunday, especially to, to make sure that we put our best foot forward. Will you help me with that? A couple of you said yes. And so we're going to work on the 23rd of this month. We're going to get the house dressed up for Easter. We've had a lot of rain. I don't know if you noticed, but the, there is grass growing in places. I didn't know grass would grow around here. And so we just, uh, 23rd from 8 to noon, we're going to work out here and get the house put back together. So uh, why don't you join us for that? All right. So I'm starting this series of talks called Expedition Easter. Expedition Easter. And this, this title came from a show that I'm a fan of, a TV show that I'm a fan of, by a guy named Josh Gates called Expedition Unknown. Has anyone ever watched that show? I love that show. And so I looked up online, what what is the premise of that show? And I'm going to read it to you straight from whatever whatever network puts that show together. It says, Expedition Unknown chronicles Josh Gates' global adventures as he investigates iconic unsolved events, lost cities, buried treasures, and other puzzling stories. 
This chronicles this dude, Josh Gates, global adventures as he investigates iconic events. I want to take that kind of an approach to the Easter story. I want us to look at this from a perspective of, what's this all about? Because I don't know about you, but I got questions. And I find that the older I get, the more I'm willing to ask God those questions. Questions like, why was all this necessary? Questions like, is Jesus who he claimed to be? Or, why did it happen the way that it happened? What could possibly create the necessity for God himself to come to earth as a human with the intent of dying? How do we know that Jesus is who he claimed to be? Does Jesus even fulfill the Bible's own claims about him? And I doubt that we'll be able to answer all of those questions in the next several weeks, but we are sure going to give it our best effort. And hopefully, we will come into Easter Sunday a little better prepared to celebrate what I am convinced is the greatest act of love that has ever happened on this earth. You know, Jesus himself said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, but to lay one's life down for his friends. So I I think I'm going to help you over the next several weeks. I'm probably going to answer some questions that you have never had answered before. I think that if you will tune in for the next few weeks, we're going to dig into some things and look at some things that will help you better, be better equipped to talk to your friends about your faith. Because everybody I meet, and you may find this shocking, but I don't look like a typical pastor. I know. Shocking. I don't know what a typical pastor is supposed to look like, but every time I'm like, I get paired up with somebody on the golf course that I don't know, by like the fifth or sixth hole, the, the question usually comes up, so what do you do? Now, the funny thing is they've been dropping F-bombs since hole one. Because golf will do that to you if you don't have control of your tongue. And I usually go, I, I'm a minister. And it's amazing how the conversation changes. It's amazing how the language changes. Because most people are genuinely respectful. And they'll say things like, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm like, don't apologize to me. You kiss your mom with that mouth? But they start asking me questions. And some of those questions are good questions. And I'm sure if we'd be honest in here this morning, we have questions too. And we know from those of you that grew up in church, you know there are certain questions like, that's just, I'm not supposed to ask that question. I mean, I'm just supposed to go, okay, I, I just believe this. You know, I believe that our faith can handle some scrutiny. Now, there is an aspect of this that's faith. We've got to take some things on faith. Faith, the Bible says, is the evidence of things that we don't see and the substance of our hope. And hope is what I'm preaching on Easter Sunday. The substance of hope. God wants to give that to every person on the planet. But why was all this necessary? And that's, that's, that's what I want to tackle today. Why? Why was all this necessary? Those of you that are readers, there's a great book out by a guy named Simon Sinek called Start With the Why. And if you're a leader, I recommend you read that book. And so I want to start today with the why. Why? Why was all this necessary? Let's pray. Father, help me to communicate in such a way that people understand. Help me to take spiritual truths and put them into a package that hits our heart and takes residence there. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Why was all this necessary? Now, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to talk about some things that I have touched on over the years as your pastor. There's, there, you can't do a series like this without repeating some things that you have touched on over the years and, 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 and mentioned in teachings. But I've been trying to put all these thoughts, like today's talk, I've been trying to take this thought and put it into a context that makes sense. And so... Some of you have heard me say some of these things before, but we're going to put it into a package today that, that takes us from one, one destination to another, okay? Because the reason all this was necessary is a simple answer that's taken me a lifetime to figure out. And the simple answer is this, because of blood. The reason all this was necessary is because of blood. Now, I want you to see what the Bible says about blood. I want you to see that, that as I spend some time on this and put this together, that, that the Bible talks about this a lot. And, and one of the things that, that we do is we talk about things in the Bible that people outside of our faith don't necessarily get. And so I want to help you with this topic so that you are better equipped to have a, an intelligent conversation about this. The Bible says in Leviticus, great book, if you, if you are new to, your, to this thing called faith, to Christianity, and you're saying, I need to read the Bible, I need to get into the Bible and read the Bible, I agree with you 100%, don't start in the book of Leviticus. Matter of fact, don't start in the Old Testament at all. Start in the book of Matthew, and then Mark, and Luke, and John in the New Testament. The book of Leviticus can bog you down, but I want to give you a truth today out of that book that I think is super relevant. It says this, in Leviticus 17, verse 11, the first part of that verse says this, for the life of a creature is in the blood. The life of every living thing is in the blood. The blood carries life. This word life, life, is mysterious. What exactly is life? Scientists don't fully understand it. We cannot reproduce life. Oh, we've been able to reproduce and recreate the environment where life can exist. But this substance called life, that's mysterious. See, the reason that it's so mysterious is, watch this, life is not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, very first book of the Bible, he's, he's dropping some knowledge on us, he's laying a foundation for us to understand something. It says this, and God breathed into Adam, and he became what? A living soul. Do you know that the only, time, the only creature on the earth that the Bible says became a living soul are humans? God breathed in something into Adam. See, what happened inside of Adam, this thing called life, is spiritual. God further expanded on Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when he said in Leviticus 17, 11, the life is in the blood. Are you still with me? Okay. See, friends, blood, watch this, it's so important. If, if you don't get this part, the rest of what I say today isn't going to make sense to you. Let me come down here so I can look you in the eye. It's hard to see you sometimes, those lights in my eyes. Watch this. Blood is the physical substance that carries his spiritual breath of life. There are different blood types, same life. There are different colors of skin, different nationalities, different cultures, different belief systems, same life. Why is that? Because, friends, blood doesn't control skin color. Blood doesn't control ethnic origin. Blood, blood's main job 
is to carry life. The life of every one of us in this room is in the blood. The life of every creature is in the blood. That's why it is possible for a seriously injured person to literally bleed to death. A strong heart can literally pump the life right out of a person's wound. Why? Because when the blood is gone, life is gone. The life of every person is in the blood. Turn to your neighbor and say, the life of every person is in the blood. See, God breathed into Adam life, his life. God breathed himself, his life into Adam, and it found a home, this life, this thing he breathed into Adam, found its home in blood, in Adam's blood. God breathed his pure, eternal life into Adam's nostrils, and it found its home in Adam's blood. That's why David wrote in Psalm 139, verse 14, I praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Nothing could be more accurate. God did this. God made us. This life thing that we are so, that is so precious, life, the reason, one of the reasons it's so precious is because it's spiritual. This is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. And we got to understand that when God created Adam, he created him in perfection. And then he said, I'm going to give you my life. God life was breathed into Adam. God life is eternal. Friends, if Adam had not sinned, he'd still be alive. He would have never died because God life was in him and God life is eternal. God always has been. God always will be. That just doesn't compute with my finite mind. Matter of fact, when I was little, my parents used to tell me God has always been. He's always been. I used to have panic attacks over it. I didn't know what it was back then. I could, you know, we didn't, we didn't articulate those things back then, but I used to go into a corner and go like, ah. I just couldn't wrap my head around no beginning and no ending. But that's what God breathed into Adam. God life. And if Adam had not blown it, if Adam had not sinned, let me just take a second and explain that to you. Just in case you're here today and this is your first time in a church, your first time hearing this story, the gospel, you're kind of kicking the tires of this thing this morning. I want to make sure that you completely understand what I'm talking about. The Bible says God created Adam and Eve and placed them in a perfect environment called the Garden of Eden. And he told them, in the book of Genesis, we can read this, hey, every seed-bearing plant and every tree with fruit on it is food for you to eat, except for one. One tree is mine. Don't touch that one. Because if you touch it, and if you eat of it, you'll die. Well, what did Adam and Eve do? The one thing they were told not to do. They ate off of the tree that God said, that's mine. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. Don't. Don't do it. And we, we've probably heard the story before. Even if you're not a church person, you've heard the story of the serpent in the garden and all that. But here's what I want you to understand. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened was they introduced sin into the world. And what that did, church, watch this. They entered a foreign substance into the bloodstream called death. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me in Romans 6 and 23 that the paycheck, the wages, the payout for sin is death. What does death do? It snuffs out life. Where's life? In the blood. See, because of sin... 
the human body became subject to corruption and decay and disease and death. So, church, hear me this morning. All death can be traced back to sin. No, there had never been sin in the world. There would be no death in the world. God is eternal. Death was never his plan. Now, if we have time, I'm going to get into the, not today, but I'm going to get into the whole philosophical thing of why did God even place the opportunity for sin in the garden. And friends, let me just say this to you. There had to be a choice. God gave humans free moral choice because chosen love is the only real love. But there's so much more to it than that. Death occurs in the physical body when life leaves its home in the blood and departs man with his spirit and his soul. So let me reiterate this morning. Blood is not life. Blood carries life. Blood is the physical substance that carries the spiritual thing we call it. becomes clear by observing what happens at death. Now, I hope, I hope that you can go through your whole life without ever having to be at somebody's bedside or, or seeing somebody pass away. When you're a pastor, that's not the case. I've, I've had, to, had the privilege of being at, at deathbeds and being there when people are translated to heaven. And I can tell you this from experience. Immediately after somebody dies, the body is still warm and will remain that way for a while. Most often, the blood is still in the body. But the person is dead. Why? Because that mysterious substance called life has left the body. So blood is not life. It is the physical substance that carries the spiritual thing we call life. Now, God used the elements of this earth when he created man. He took dirt and he formed Adam. And in that dirt, he found the chemical compositions necessary to create what we call blood. And then he breathed the spiritual substance into that blood called life. That means, watch this, watch this, the contact between the divine and the human rests in what we call blood. There is something divine inside of you, and we call that life. That contact was destroyed when Adam chose rebellion over relationship. This is why all this was necessary. See, because of sin, when Adam and Eve chose rebellion over relationship with God, they set into motion all of the events that would be necessary to get man ready for Easter Sunday. And what we celebrate on Easter, what we are going to celebrate in just a few weeks, we are going to re remember and recognize what Jesus did on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday. All of that started, the clock started ticking when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They introduced something into man that was never intended to be there. And so God, in his wisdom, in his infinite, in his in His uh, omnipotence and his omniscience, he said, I have a solution. So what are we supposed to do? Because we didn't eat the fruit in the garden, but we are ancestors of the one that did. And so because of that, our bloodline has been tainted with a, with a foreign substance called death. See, friends, what you need this morning, 
what every human on the planet needs is a blood transfusion. We need to have that foreign substance washed from our blood. We need to have the sin removed from our blood. Watch this now. Watch this. Because it was blood that was affected, listen to me, because it was blood that was affected, blood must be the one that fixes it. Because the life in the blood was corrupted, life in the blood must make atonement. Let me finish Leviticus 17, 11 for you. I'd read you the first part. Watch this. For the life of every creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. What has he given to us? Blood. For what? Atonement. Hebrews 9, that's Old Testament. Let me give you New Testament. Hebrews 9.22 says this, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And watch this. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Are you tracking with me this morning? Let me recap. Blood carries life. Life is spiritual. When sin entered the world, blood was affected. Blood was tainted, and death was introduced. There is no escape now from sin and death without the shedding of blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, listen, the Father teaches us all throughout the Bible. From the very beginning to the very end, there's a scarlet thread woven through all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We started with Adam. Let's go on to ancient Egypt. Exodus 12 tells us about the 10th plague. Exodus is about the Hebrew slaves being delivered from Egypt. And and most of us know this story in here. How God sent Moses and, and God performed 10 plagues on Egypt to get them to let his people go. Let's fast forward to the 10th plague. It is a plague of blood. Because it's a plague of death. I'm just going to read. There's several verses I want to pull out of Exodus 12 this morning. Verse 3 says this. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of the month, each man is to take a lamb from from, from his family, one for each household. And this is what they're going to do. They're going to kill that lamb, drain that blood into into a basin, and then grab a hyssop branch, and they're going to mark their house with it. Verse 7. Take some of the blood and put it in on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses. And in that house, you're to eat that lamb that night. On that same night, I'm going to pass through Egypt. This is God talking. And I will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. That's a great study. For I am the Lord. Watch this. And the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. Is God talking, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destruction, no plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Verse 21, so then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on the sides of the door frames of your home. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. Let me me make sure you see this. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. You see that? Does everyone see that? Talk to me. You see that? Major important. Major important. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of your door frame, and he will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter into your houses to strike you down. This is where we get the term Passover. This is where it all started. This is also where we get the Christianese term under the blood. 
How many guys have heard that term before, under the blood? Yeah, it's Christianese. It's secret code words for Christians. People outside of our faith don't understand what we're talking about when we say, are you under the blood? Is that under the blood? Did you put that under the blood? It's Christianese. But this is where we get it. Watch this now. Being inside the house under the covering of the blood protected you. Under the covering of the blood marking on the doors. When the destroyer came, Jesus said the destroyer comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. You had to be, you needed to be under the blood covering. So, can we just get hypothetical for a minute this morning? Can we just talk for a minute? What if? What if you decided to ignore those rules? What if you made up your own rules? Hmm. What if you started thinking, Moses and Aaron aren't the only ones that hear from God? I hear from God. God didn't tell me we needed to be under the blood. I just don't feel like this is a thing we need to do. I don't have to be under all these rules and bondage. That's just law. I don't have to be under the law. Fine. Don't listen to the men of God. That's your choice. However, you're going to die. See, if you refuse to do what the man of God is telling you, God has instructed you need to do to be saved from the destroyer, you need, you're going to die. Maybe you're one of those people just need to see for yourself. Seeing is believing, Pastor. What if you'd have ventured out that night from under the covering of the blood marking on your door frame? Remember what the instructions were? Do not go out from under this while the destroyer is at work. I just need to see. For, I mean, fine. You're going to die. What if you decided to do things your own way? Hey, listen, what Moses is preaching is just too narrow. There are many paths that lead to safety. There are many paths that lead to God. This is just way too narrow for me. I don't need this lamb's blood to be right with God. I'm a righteous person. And I just feel, Pastor, I just feel like if God is love, then he would not allow the destroyer to come into my house anyway. Fine. Think that way. You're going to die. Pastor, I don't believe. Fine. Pastor, I've done a bunch of good things in my life. You know, last week I gave money to the starving children in Africa. I even put 20 bucks in the offering. Fine. Good for you. You're still going to die. God said, you must be under this blood covering. And from Genesis to Revelation, watch this, friends. God has been establishing this truth. You must be under the blood. Now, I saw something interesting here. I just, I'm going to throw this out. This is free. But did you notice that they put the blood on the door posts and the top of the door? But they didn't put it on the threshold? I mean, wouldn't you want to just... Why not? Watch this. Because the blood of the Lamb of sacrifice is never to be underfoot. You cannot trample the blood of the Lamb and get away with it. 
The blood of the lamb is for atonement. An innocent life is sacrificed in your place. And so we must treat it with respect. That was free. Uh, let me keep going. Even after Passover, the, the, the priests remembered the blood. Look at Leviticus chapter 8, verse 24. They knew the power of the blood. They knew they needed to always be under the, the blood covering. So in Leviticus 8, watch this. Moses brought all Aaron's sons forward, and he put some blood on the lobes of their right ears. He put it on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. And then he splashed blood against the sides of the altar. Why would he do this? What is scripture teaching us here? Watch this. Blood covering. Blood covering will cleanse what goes into a man's ear. Blood covering will cover what a man's hands find to do. And the blood covering will, t will cover you wherever your feet take you. When you are under the blood covering, all of you is covered. The blood covering is important to the life of every believer. The blood covering. Can I take this a little, just a little further this morning? Joshua chapter 2. Joshua is about to lead Israel into the promised land. Joshua sent two Israelite spies to spy out Jericho. And they almost got caught while they were in Jericho. But a prostitute named Rahab rescued them and then asked that they repay her kindness by saving her family. And these spies said the only way to rescue her is the blood. They remembered the blood promise and the life of the blood promise. They said, Rahab, if you want to be saved, you need to be under the blood covering. So what did they do? Rahab, if you want to live, if you want your family to live, whenever we come in to conquer your city, Jericho, hang this scarlet rope from your window. Make sure it's scarlet because it represents the blood covering that was the covering of Passover. A scarlet rope hung from her window. I believe she used scarlet rope to let them down out of the window of her house. Just like the blood on the door of the night of Passover, this scarlet rope was hanging from her. Blood carried, watch this, blood carried life for Rahab and her whole family. I love the fact that she is a lady of the night. I love the fact that she is like, oh my gosh, the worst of sinners. Because the blood can cover anything that you do or have done in your life. Once Rahab, watch this church, once Rahab was in the presence of these two children of the Most High God, she was convicted of her sin and she confessed faith in God. Look at Joshua 2 verse 11 says this, when he heard it, when we heard of it, speaking of, we heard that you were coming, you, she's telling the two spies this, we heard you were coming and that God was with you. Our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed them for your Lord, your God is the God of heaven above and on the earth below. She is confessing faith in Yahweh. She is saying, I believe that your God is the one true God. And so the spies told her, if you want to live, you want your whole house and your whole family to, to live, you must be under the blood. And I would say to you this morning, if you want to live, if you want your whole family to live, you must be under the blood covering this morning. See, these spies, this promise to Rahab took them all the way back to Egypt. And that same promise on the night of the Passover still covered her Hundred, what was it, 80 years later. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt 40 years later. We see all throughout the Old Testament, I could take you to situation after situation this morning, where the blood of an innocent lamb was shed for the covering of the sins of man. 
Blood protected them from the destroyer. Every year, Israel would, Israel would remember the Passover by sacrificing another lamb for their sins. One lamb for every family, another lamb for the entire nation, year after year. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. But ultimately, God knew that man needed to be cleansed once and for all. And the answer was not another Passover lamb. No. What was needed was a man dying once and for all. It was a man that had blown it. It had to be a man that atoned for it. But it had to be a man without the sin condition in his blood. What the world needed was an innocent man who could meet the requirements of the sin sacrifice. One who would eventually be called the Lamb of God. But only God himself, coming as a man, could meet these requirements. And this is where we pick up the story of Jesus. Because the key here will be a human being born without the blood of Adam in his veins. Why? Because the blood of Adam is tainted by sin. I hear the washing happening. So, if Adam's blood is tainted by sin, then his ancestors' blood would be tainted by sin. So on December, every December 25th, we remember, we celebrate Jesus being born of a virgin by supernatural conception. A human being born not of the seed of Adam or the egg of Eve, but of God. Listen, super important you get this part. I'm laying a foundation for us this morning that will take us to Easter. Are you still with me? Okay. See, when man's seed meets the egg of woman, life is conceived. And the child in that womb gets its blood type, half from dad, half from mom. This is so cool. Dr. William Standish Reed of the Children's or of the Christian Medical Foundation in Tampa, Florida, did research on this. Watch this. He he really dug into this topic, and I've read his stuff. What he discovered is this: the blood type of the child is determined at conception. Then Watch this. That child is protected by the placenta from the flow of any of the mother's blood into the fetus. Meaning this. The mother's blood never flows into the baby in her womb. That's why the Bible is very explicit in saying that this conception in Mary was supernatural. Now watch this. The Christ child that was born in Bethlehem on that first Christmas did not get its blood type from Joseph or from Mary. And Mary's blood never entered into that baby's womb. The baby was born of a virgin, so it had a completely different blood type. It's a completely different bloodline than Adam's. He is completely different than what Adam's race was bringing forth, meaning that that bloodline came from heaven itself. And we see now that the research of Dr. Reed, Mary's blood never entered into the child growing in her womb. There's an, this is an entirely different bloodline being, being entered into to the earth. It was a man but not a man of Adam's race. It was a completely different bloodline, did not inherit the sin condition of Adam and Eve. 
Jesus didn't inherit Joseph's bend for whatever his sin condition was. He didn't inherit Mary's bend for, no, Jesus' blood was pure and sinless at birth. That's why Jesus is often referred to in the Bible as the second Adam. He was human, but not of Adam's race. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 tells us this when it says this. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Are you still with me, church? You see, when Jesus was born of the virgin, he was pure and sinless. That's why all that was necessary. But it doesn't just end there. Next week, we got to look at this. He may have been born sinless, but he had to stay sinless. He had to stay sinless to qualify to be the sacrifice of the sins of mankind. And the question I have is, did he make it? Is Jesus who he claimed to be? Are we going to talk about the sin condition of Jesus? That's next week. But before we close this service, I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way to the platform right now. Before we close this service, I want to make sure that everyone in this room is under the blood covering. Spoiler alert, Jesus wins. All the way from Genesis to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11 tells us this, and they, we, overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. You see, you remember that destroyer all the way back in Exodus? His main job is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He entered into the Garden of Eden with the intent of destroying, of stealing, of killing. And he enters in to your life and to my life with the intent of stealing, killing, and destroying. And today, I have given you enough gospel so that you have all you need to overcome this foe. Because all you need is the blood covering. All you need is to allow the blood to mark your door. Jesus came for one reason, to spill blood. So that we can apply it to the doorposts and the mantles of our house. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus speaking, he says this, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and they with me. Have you applied the blood to the doorposts of your heart yet? Are you under the blood covering? You see, I can't I can't let you leave this room without giving you an opportunity. I would love, you know, the, the, the communicator in me wants to preach all of the messages in this series so that you understand everything and then say, okay, now are you ready? But it would be irresponsible of me to not give you an opportunity right now to get under this blood covering. Because without the shedding of blood, 
There's no forgiveness. There's no, there's no hope. But blood was shed. And I want to give you hope this morning. So I want to invite you in this moment to respond to God's invitation to apply the blood to the door of your house, the door of your heart. There's absolutely nothing that will fix your sin condition but that. Are you ready? Are you ready to make that decision today? You ready to say yes? God, just, just would you just apply the blood to the door of my heart? I'm not talking about joining our church, although we'd love to have you. I'm not talking about how much money you give or how many good things you do. I'm not even talking about what you did last night. What I'm talking about is what you do right now with the knowledge you've been given. Are you ready? Because Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And so, Father, all across this room this morning, as we consider why all this was necessary, I know there are people in this room, there are people watching this online that need to allow you to take that hyssop branch in heaven and supernaturally dip it into that blood covering and apply it to the doorposts of our heart. And Lord, before we heard all this, we didn't quite, many of us didn't understand what all that meant, but now we do. Now we get it. And maybe you're here today and you've been coming to church for a long time, but it never clicked before. This is where you start. You don't start by getting all the sin out of your life because you can't. You don't start by giving up that habit because you probably won't. You start by allowing God to apply the covering to the door of your heart and that gives him access to you and he begins doing the work on each of us. So in this moment, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to know who I'm praying for this morning. If you're here, say, Pastor, I need to apply that blood to the door of my heart. Would you just lift your hand real quick and put it back down? All across this room, I see hands going up all over the place. You can put them down. Father, you've seen these hands. Too many to even begin to, you know. Lord, would you take and apply the blood to the door of their heart? Matter of fact, we're just going to say it out loud. Everyone together, let's say it. Jesus, I give you permission. I open the door. Cover me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me together, church. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to bless you. Worship team's going to sing. And you leave when you're ready. If you have kids, though, would you go get them now? Father, bless each person this morning, I pray. Thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you for every person in this room. God, I pray you would fill this house with seekers wanting to know who Jesus is. In your precious name, amen.